Good morning, friends. My name is John Morgan. My pronouns are he and him. It's been a holy week. Um, God has shown up in many different ways. I want to first give praise uh, for uh, Ash Wednesday, and uh, thank you to all of you who participated in the Holy Moments just right out here at the corner of uh, 5th and St. Clair, and uh, what uh, beautiful moments where uh, people came in, in contact with the presence of God, some very unexpectedly, didn't know that they would that day. Um, my favorite part or one of my favorite parts is when we did the sign of the cross with the ashes on, on folks' foreheads. Uh, we used the words, repent and believe in the good news and know that you are loved. And have you ever considered just the blessing of this location right here where we, where we have worship and just that we get to encounter uh, so many people, especially on a weekday like that? Um, I'm so thankful for... Uh, the neon, uh, the folks who just have opened up this place for us and allow us uh, to participate in this way. Uh, this marks the beginning of a journey that we call the Lenten season. We're uh, preparing our hearts for the resurrection on Easter Sunday, a journey that invites us to reflect on uh, where we are now in our life of faith, and a journey that also uh, draws us closer to God, and, and we understand how much de God desires to love us and to draw us closer. Today, we're staying in the book of Luke. Uh, if you've been with us the last few weeks, we're actually going to flip back a few pages, a few chapters, actually, to Luke chapter 4. We're going to settle in one of the traditional uh, first Sunday of Lent scripture, and I have a confession to make. It's actually like blew me away a little bit after 23 years of being in the ministry. This is actually the first time that I will be preaching on this particular text. And I got stuck this week and didn't know, like the words just wouldn't go um, onto the page. And you all might know when I get stuck or when I'm just needing uh, to experience God's presence Sometimes I uh, retreat to my Catholic roots, and I found myself on the Marquette University webpage of all places and found the most beautiful uh, faith devotion, and I just Google searched uh, Lenten devotions, and here I found myself. And I know no one from uh, Marquette University is going to even see or hear, or, or they don't even know that Hope Collective or John Morton exists, but I just want to give credit where credit's due, because a few of those sentences on that website just inspired me so much, and some of those words end up on the page this morning. So we're going to start out with Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, read the next uh, phrase with me, full of the Holy Spirit, yes, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was what? Famished. Now, how many of you would be famished after not eating for 40 days? Right? Like, how about after four days? Famish? I, here's another confession. After four hours of not eating, my tummy begins to <laughs> grumble a little bit. But this is 40 days of not eating. This is more than just being hungry, right? The translation says famish. The Greek word is pinao, which means an intense desire or craving. Now, doesn't that make sense that Jesus would have this intense desire to eat or to be filled up, was craving at that moment? So at the beginning of Jesus' documented ministry, this is his first act of emptying himself. It's weird to think about the person on earth who has the most power relinquishes it all. He makes himself hungry, vulnerable, and even weak. And he does this in the wilderness, or our translations sometimes say in the desert, where there is no resource, no support, no relief in sight, 
And here's what's weird about what Jesus does. He, he does all of this on purpose. It makes sense, but when, when we uh, read those words together, do you remember verse 1? He emptied himself, but he wasn't empty because he had who in him? The Holy Spirit. There's a reason why we use the scripture to set the stage for the Lenten season. We're challenged to fast. Remember, we talked about this last week. We're challenged to fast from something that we crave if we don't have. It's a way of emptying our own selves. It's a way that we give up our own power and our own control. It makes us vulnerable. And I think uh, this will all make sense in just a moment when we read through the scripture. But can we just pause for a moment? And give thanks. Because if we don't get anything else out of today's scripture, if we don't get anything else even out of the whole entire Lenten season, we can get this, that Jesus understands what it means to be hungry. Jesus knows what it's like to be in the desert. He's gone through this uh, period of loneliness He's been exhausted. He knows what it means to, to not be in control, to not be able to rely on his own power, to not have any resources or anyone to turn to. Sometimes when we feel these things in our own lives, when we're in those desert places of our life, we may ask the question, why? Or maybe, God, why is this happening to me? And sometimes we try to put some spiritual words to it, even in a negative tone. We might say, well, God must be punishing me now. That's why I'm in this desert place. Or sometimes we might quote those uh, or misquote the scripture. And you've heard this said before, uh, well, there's a reason for everything. Or uh, maybe you've heard it said or you, you said before, um, well, God won't give you more than you and you can't handle. And when we try to over-spiritualize and, and we mi misquote scripture, it, it isn't very helpful, is it? <laughs> Here's what I get from today's scripture that I think is helpful. When we find ourselves in those desert places, even when we don't know how we got there, God isn't afraid to move into the desert with us. God's been there before, right? And even if we do know how we got to the desert, because let's be honest, we get to the desert places in life a lot of times because of the poor decisions that we make, right? And we find ourselves in, in this lonely, uh, where, where we just feel empty. But guess what? Even if it is our own fault that we're in the desert, God is still not afraid to move into the desert with us because God has been there before. Sometimes in accountability circles, we use the acronym HALT. Have you heard this before to describe the desert places? Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And... Uh, I think Jesus was at least three of these things, right? Hungry, lonely, tired. It doesn't say anything about being angry, but he didn't eat for 40 days. Can we just assume that he was angry a little bit, right? Like maybe. And we use this term halt, which tells us to stop before we do anything dumb, anything stupid, before we give into temptation, before we go to that quick fix, simply and in this case, realize we're not alone. God's really with us. So we recognize that Jesus emptied himself full of the Holy Spirit. Let's see how he dealt with these three temptations. Starting with verse 3, the devil said to him, If you are the what? Son of God. He's saying, if you are who you really say you are, <laughs> command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, read this with me. It is written, one does not live by bread alone. Jesus was tempted as we all get tempted, right? 
He quoted scripture, and, and you'll see three times the scriptures that he quote come from the book of Deuteronomy. The temptations aren't bad in themselves. In fact, the temptations give us an opportunity where we can actually turn to God. Or we can turn away from God. In this instance, Jesus had the opportunity. He could turn to God and quote this the scripture, or he could turn away from God and rely on this resource, this quick fix in his life. We have the same opportunity when we're tempted. Turn to God, turn away from God. So today, the first invitation is halt, turn to God. Will you say those words with me? Halt, turn to God. Andy, will you remember that first one for me? Oh, turn to God, all right? I'm going to call, I'll call on you, <laughs> all right? Here's a, okay, another confession. Last night, I remembered around 9.30, I hadn't written the script for the announcements yet. And so, I'm, you know, some of the announcements are the same, right? Like, hey, welcome, here's our mission statement, core values, uh, check the website, uh, here's how you can give an offering. And then I was remembering um, okay, the book study is coming up. We need to make sure people sign up for that. George is going to be here for the cookies, and then we'll have a prayer. And then all of a sudden, my heart sank. George is going to be here for the cookies. I haven't baked cookies yet. Oh my God. And what was I tempted to do, George? Buy them. Yes, I was going to go out and buy the 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 cookies that look like the, the most home-baked cookies. I could. And I was very tempted to do that. And then I was like, no, I have to, I, I need to pray over the cookies while I make them. And as I put the, the uh, cookies into, um, into the oven, I got this sheet out. And I'm just going to be honest here. I was reading the instructions. Okay, pray, I'm doing that. Uh, cookies in the bag, I got the bags. And I got to this one part that says, please don't use burned or blemished cookies. They are, they are intended to represent God's perfect love for everyone. That's pressure. That is a lot of pressure. And I, and I was tempted to do what again? Just to go out and buy cookies because I, I couldn't do this. Sometimes we're tempted to take that shortcut, right? to do the quick fix. And sometimes it's more than just trying to avoid burnt cookies. <laughs> but we have uh, this invitation. What is it, Andy, to do what? Turn to, God. Turn to God. Turn to God. Here comes another temptation. The devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him. Read this part with me. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only God. I love it how he keeps going back to, uh, to the scripture that he knew. Underneath the different temptations uh, of Jesus, there's, there's this temptation to uh, trade in his identity for something else. So even in this one, there's this temptation to trade in his identity of son of God for this false power. And Jesus is like, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't who I am. And again, he quotes scripture. Are not our temptations trying to get us to deny our identity and to trade in the calling upon our lives? Instead, the temptation is to turn to unhealthy ways to satisfy ourselves. But the invitation is to halt and remember who I am. Say those words with me. Halt. Remember who I am. Mia, will you remember that one? Yes. Remember who I am. The first one is what, Andy? Turn to God. Turn to God. The second one is remember who I am. Remember who I am. 
Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their heads, hands, they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, read this part with me. It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is really interesting. By resisting this temptation, Jesus chose to trust God completely. As he turned to the book of Deuteronomy one more time. But this one was tricky. Because Satan tried to make the temptation look like scripture. He actually quoted Psalm 91 verses 11 12, and 12. For God will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Here's... Here's where we really have to be careful because sometimes temptation is dressed up like holiness. Do you know that? The evil one will even use scripture out of context to convince you of lies. Let me repeat that. The evil one will even use scripture out of context to convince you of lies. Oh, how often... But when you experience even the trickiest of temptations, the invitation is to do what Jesus did, to halt and trust God completely. Halt and trust God completely. Who's going to remember that? Susan, are you going to remember that one? Halt and trust God completely. Andy, what do we have? Turn to God. Turn to God. Remember who I am. Remember who I am. Trust God completely. I'm going to call on you three again at the end, all right? Maybe you've been in the wilderness or desert place before. Maybe that place is today. I see some heads nodding like this. I'm not going to call you out, though. (laughs) Maybe you're feeling hungry angry, lonely, tired, or maybe one of those, or a combination. (laughs) First of all, remember you're not alone, that God has moved into the desert with you. There's this wilderness prayer. If you uh, have watched online, uh, a lot of times I use the Eucharistic prayer book. This is where this came out of. And I thought we would uh, pray this together as we lead into our time of communion. Will you pray with me? Forgiving God in the season of repentance, make your mercy sufficient for every need. Come to your children who are in their own wilderness and make their wanderings holy paths of learning your truth. Strengthen all who face the threshold of temptation or the turmoil of trial. Seek those whose hearts are remorseful and meet them with grace. Renew your church from the depths of your heart where justice and mercy meet. Bring us with all your saints to the day when all who watch and pray for your kingdom behold your salvation and meet you in your resurrection. God, most glorious creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.